Two words that all candle bearers at Mass hate, longer form. Good job, you guys. That was, that was a long gospel. Oh. <laughs> there is so much in this gospel, um, kind of hard to pick something to choose. Uh, it's, it's long as it remains, so I won't keep this, this homily too long. Um, but I'll just touch on a couple of things. Uh, first, today is a Laetare Sunday. Uh, one of the options is to wear rose. I'm not really a pink kind of guy, so I've gone with purple, which is also an option. But traditionally at this point in Lent, there's the option to kind of lighten your fasting a little uh, and uh, rejoice a little more, kind of refresh yourself during your uh, fasting here before you dive on into the rest of Lent. So uh, maybe an extra slice of cake or something this evening or tomorrow would be very appropriate, okay? Um, the readings are, they present to us a bit of a contradiction, uh, a bit of a contradiction. Maybe that's one of the simple points I could, I could furnish here. From the first reading we see in the book of Samuel, um, that uh, he's, he's looking to anoint, he's looking to anoint the king. And so he's looking at all these sons here, and he sees this big strong guy, and Samuel's thinking, surely this must be it. And what does God say? Uh, I do not see as you see. And so he's waiting and waiting until finally the youngest son whom he sees, a very young, ruddy youth, David, comes in. And God says, this is him, this is the one, anoint him. If you actually pay attention to the wording, it's actually where we get our strong precedent for the sacrament of confirmation as well. He is anointed, and from that point on, the Holy Spirit is present with David. So it's, it's a good one to read just to kind of uh, brush up on your scriptural um, basis for confirmation. It's really beautiful. But it, it remains. God does not see as we see. And the same thing we also see here how uh, the Lord tells the Pharisees, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sin remains. And truly the man whose eyes he, oh, whose eyes he opened is the one that is now speaking with wisdom, that has seen that Jesus Christ is truly God. And so what does he do? He worships him. The Pharisees in their hardness of heart, they say, you were born totally in sin and you are trying to teach us. Then they threw him out. So we see a lot of contradictions here, a lot of seeming contradiction. Namely, that the Lord is using the weak, all right, using the weak to show his glory. That only truly, only those who admit that they are blind are the ones that see a, a young, uh, seemingly weak youth like David is truly meant to be the one who is anointed. A good question is, why does God not favor the strong? Why does he not favor the strong? That's almost like a good philosophical question, right? I mean, if you think about it, we profess that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. He can do anything, and he has created all of us out of nothing. So how could it be that this God, who is all-powerful, is the one that chose the young, ruddy David to be anointed? Or the one that used the blind man to show off the Pharisees? What's up with that? If we were thinking just philosophically, then we might have all reason to think that that's how God, that God would favor the straw. And truly, many philosophers who have reasoned to some kind of one singular God, and there have been many, uh, Aristotle is one in particular, Plato is another one, they talk about the one, the good, they would probably profess something like that. They also profess, however, that this God wouldn't want to do anything with us. He's just like a lot of, a lot, like a lot of deists from the uh, 17th and 18th centuries also profess. He's just kind of this big, powerful God. Maybe he's a watchmaker. He just sets all things in motion and leaves us alone. Right? All this myriad of, of different thoughts. What we profess in God, right, we, we most certainly profess that he is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and many natural philosophers can reason to that too. But what they can't reason to uh, is truly to who God is, truly. And that's what makes us very, very different as Christians. The fact that God chooses the weak, right, to show forth his glory, 
to, to, uh, to show off the strong uh, is due to who he is, who he has revealed us to be, and that is an exchange of love. An exchange of love. No philosopher could ever, ever, ever reason to that. The Trinity, the exchange of love between Father and Son, with that love being the third person of the Trinity, that is something that we could only ever know by God's gracious gift of revelation. By God's gracious gift of revelation. Now, what does that have to do with all this? Well, each one of the persons is, a tr- is just a true gift, complete self-gift, one to the other. The Father gives the Son everything. The Son gives everything in return. And truly, the Holy Spirit is that love of self-gift between the two. So, if that God, that God of true self-gift were to do on something like take on a humanity or be an example for humanity, what kind of form would he take on? He would take on the kind of form, the kind of person, the kind of form of someone who completely gives himself out of love to others, who puts himself in a disposition that is completely vulnerable, one of complete servitude. And so indeed, that's what Jesus Christ did here for us, right? Because he is manifesting who God is, not just just in that humanity he took on, but truly in his crucifixion. He's manifesting that self-gift, who he is, by what Jesus does. And and so in in that same vein, he's also chosen a poor man who has nothing, truly, uh, to show off off this glory. So it's something good for us to remember. Um, Now, if if you, like, you know, go to the gym and get big muscles or something or become successful, is God going to hate you? No. (laughs) That's not what I'm saying either. And those things can be fine. Those things can be great. It is the disposition of the heart that God is talking about that we don't try to, that we do not believe that we do anything without Him. That He gives to us everything and that He wants everything in return. And that is what God means when He tells Samuel, You do not see as I see, you see as humans see. The way God sees is that He's looking for people who can give a total gift of love back. Thomas Aquinas actually distinguishes pride um, based on this concept. He he distinguishes four different categories, and I'm not going to take you through that catechesis now. But the gist of it is, is that pride is born in our heart. It's an interior movement of our heart whereby we believe and act upon the thought that we somehow deserve something without God, or that somehow we got something without God. And that's kind of at the core of pride, truly. It's not the fact that you know that you're great. You know that awesome gym trainer that's going to help you get those big muscles? He can't be like, no, I'm weak and tiny, or messy playing on the soccer field. Can't be like, no, no, I'm terrible, I'm terrible at soccer. That's not humility. And honestly, to know that you're good at something isn't pride. The disposition of thinking that you do it without God in one way or another is where pride truly lies. And that is what God hates and what truly like a weak person like this blind man has none of in his heart. He just completely receives the gift of God's love and it's for that reason that he's able to glorify God. He's able to teach something to the Pharisees that they don't know about because truly the Pharisees in their pride are still blind. That might be a little takeaway for you. Um, Pride. Am I living somehow without God? Are my actions, are my dispositions in such a way that I'm kind of trying to leave, live some corner of my life um, as if I owned it, as if God didn't have any access to it? That might be a good point of self-reflection. Pride is one of the worst sins we can commit, and so being able to you know, scavenge our hearts to be able to look for it, to wipe it out, is a great thing we can do in our Christian life. I hope that you can take the example of the man born blind, of, of the young, humble King David, anointed by Samuel, and continue to work on that during this Lent, to truly allow the Lord instead to fill your heart, to become blind, as it were, so that he can help you see in the way that we're meant to see.